You're listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast brought to you by Nottinghamshire Live. Good afternoon and welcome to Garibaldi Red, the Nottingham Forest podcast from Nottinghamshire Live. Uh, my name's Matt Davis and we are joined today by Forest fan, uh, BT Sports League commentator, Five Eye presenter, Darren Fletcher. Um, good afternoon, Fletch. How are you doing? Good, thank you, Matt. How are you? Yeah, very well, very well. I get a bit nervous when professional broadcasters are on because they know what they're doing and I don't. Um, and you're a jack of well, a master of all trades, being a commentator and a presenter, so you know exactly how difficult it is. But thanks for joining us. We do appreciate it. My pleasure. A busy 24 hours, a very busy 24 hours. It's Lamucci out within 30 minutes, I think. Chris Hewson was in. What did you make of it all, Darren, in terms of the decision making, the appointment? What are your just your general views on the situation? I was a little bit um, surprised in in the manner of it. Not, not in terms of Sabri losing his job, because I think when you lose a game as heavily as he did, with the consequences at the back end of last season, based around the way the season finished, you have an issue. There, there was clearly an issue in there in terms of the way the season started, the way the season progressed, was vastly different to the way it finished. So things had changed quite significantly by the time they were blown away by Stoke at the end. Um, the thing that surprised me a little bit is, is I think you've then got two options. You either make a managerial change at that stage, and I know that might have been difficult, bearing in mind Sabri had just signed a new contract. But I think the other version is, is is then to allow the manager to sign players, which is what Forrest chose to do. But then you get this situation where the season doesn't start well. The new manager's influence the signing of 13 new players. You've got a really big playing squad. And then you decide to sack the manager. I'm a little bit conflicted that when you sign that number of players, logic would dictate that you've then got to give the manager a, a period of time to try and work out what his best team is and how it's going to look, and et cetera, et cetera. So... I'm just a little bit surprised that everything's kind of happened. That they've signed players, they've sacked a manager, they've brought a new one in. Everything seems to have happened. What, what I hope now, though, is that I think this is a really sensible move with Chris. Chris is vastly experienced in in getting teams out of the Championship and then keeping them in the Premier League. Um, and, and I think he, he looks to me to be a really good fit. I mean, I kind of got in my mind that if they were going to get rid of Sabri, then they've got to go down this line. They've got to look at someone like Sam Allardyce or Chris Hewson, someone with a, a proven track record of, of, of promotion and then being able to, to sustain a team in the Premier League because that is the sole focus of Nottingham Forest. You know, that's what they're doing it for. They want to be a Premier League team. So you have to have the right man in charge to do it. I think they've taken a number of calculated gambles um, in terms of foreign coaches that hadn't worked. And I think the sensible approach now is to try someone with the proven track record who's been there and done it before, who can possibly, you know, get them to where they want to be. Of course, the caveat now is Chris needs time. They've got to put complete faith in him and allow him to do the job that he's been really good at doing. And I think if they do that, they'll get success. What insight can you give people into Chris in terms of your dealings with him and people that you know in the game, like like Kevin Nolan, who can give some good um, insight into what Chris is like? What can you tell viewers about him as, as a manager? Well, first and foremost, what I would say is you never hear anything bad about Chris Hewton, which in football is, I think that speaks volumes, doesn't it? You know, because everybody's got an opinion about everybody and everything. Um, hence why we're talking today, I suppose. Um but everybody has that opinion and there's a lot of negativity surrounding people. And I never really hear that with Chris. He's very approachable. He's very professional. He's hardworking. Um, he has been successful wherever he's been. And the only negative thing that I really heard about Chris was at the back end at Brighton where Chris's, Chris's, role at the time was to keep them in the Premier League. So Chris went for a defensive brand of football, didn't take too many chances. And, you know, I think the crowd wanted to see Brighton play a bit more expansively, which they're doing now under Graham Potter. But that wasn't Chris's way. So there was a bit of negativity about the way Brighton played towards the back end coming from the supporters. But you can't underestimate the job that he did there to get them into the Premier League and then keep them into the Premier League. Remember, they're everybody's favourites to get relegated the season they got promoted, yet they were able to survive. 
um, and get some pretty decent results against decent sides as well. So I think in terms of him as a man, I think you'll enjoy dealing with him for a start. I think he's the perfect figurehead for the football club. He'll take his position very uh, seriously. He acts responsibly all of the time. He's a leader of men. Um, and I think he will find a way to get the best out of the squad of players that are there. Um, it might take him a little bit of time. But, but I think, I mean, th there are so many risks involved with changing the manager and bringing in a new one. But I think when you bring in Chris Hewton, you are reducing the risk factor significantly because of how good a manager he is and how much experience and how much success he's had in doing exactly this job um, at previous clubs. Do you think um, he's the right appointment at the right time in the sense that, as you say, they've signed a rockload of players. They couldn't really roll the dice on anyone, could they, and take a gamble on a foreign coach who didn't know the league? They sort of backed into a corner and had to go down this route, do you think? I think he's... Well, he's not short of options, is he? I mean, he's got plenty of players to choose from, so you'd, you'd, you'd like to think that somehow he can find an eleven that works out of the, the vast number of players that are there. I mean, one thing you can never accuse the owner, the ownership and the, the, the board of directors, etc., at the city ground, is you can never accuse them of not backing the manager, can you? In terms of bringing players in. I mean, they're, they're as active in the transfer market as any team in the country. So um, he, can, he can probably play however he wants to because there should be a player that should fit that system somewhere within the squad. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's the big thing. I think what it needs now, it needs putting back on course. You know, the club at the moment has gone from... I mean, if you look at it, if you look back at it logically last year, even an average finish probably would have got them automatic promotion. People talk about missing out on the playoffs. But if you think about how bad the finish was and how it all dropped in terms of the amount of points they didn't get, if they'd have had an average finish, they would have been bang there for automatic promotion. So it was quite a slide. Um, but what I would say is now, with him, first of all, you've got to get it back on the right track. You know, it's, it's got to become a team that regains its confidence, that learns how to win again, that becomes consistent again. And I think that will take a little bit of time, but I think he'll know how to do that very effectively. He's done it at other clubs in the past. So that's important. And I think you're right. I think the circumstances that, that Forrest have right now need someone with experience who can come in, work out what the best shape is, what the best team is, work out which of the players he wants to work with and the ones that he doesn't because there has to be players leaving the, the, the club. They can't possibly continue with a, a first-team squad of this size. So he's got to come in there and work out the players that he thinks can take, the, take them on, on his journey. Um, and I think he'll do that quicker than someone who's got to learn the league at the same time. You know, I think that's always a difficult thing. The Championship is a unique league. There's a way to get out of it. That's why certain managers have success. You'd put Chris in that bracket. You'd put Steve Bruce in that bracket. You'd put Neil Warnock in that bracket. Probably put Big Sam in that bracket. There's a lot of managers that you would put in the bracket of know what it takes to get out of the championship. And Chris is one of those managers. So the fact that he knows how to do it, I think gives him a fighting chance. How likely do you think it is that he'll dip into the domestic market before October 16th? I mean, you've touched on the, the kind of mad transfer policy there. Would he be wise to make even more dealings to get players in that he knows? Or should he just take take stock and have a look at the squad that he's got, which is, as you say, absolutely massive? I think that's the balance, isn't it? I think unless there's an area of the squad that he absolutely feels is too weak, I wonder whether they would be going back into the market again. I mean, unless you could, unless you could see a number of players leave to open up some space, just, just managing that number of players and trying to work out how it's going to go with, with so many players to choose from brings an element of difficulty. I think if he comes in, though, and he, and he identifies a particular area that he wants to, to strengthen, I'd be very surprised if, if the club didn't back him and allow him to do it, because that's, that's what happens. So I don't think anything would surprise me in transfer terms because of how busy they've been. Hmm. But you'd like to think... That with the number of players that have been brought in since the end of last season, that there should be a group there that could be very successful in the Championship. But, of course, he's got tremendous connections to the Premier League and he will have good relationships with Premier League clubs and Premier League managers. So there might well be you know, players that Forrest might not have been able to have 
that now are available because the Premier League transfer window is closed and they can only deal with the FL clubs. So there might just be a couple of players that could add some real sparkle to the squad that he might be able to get a hold of. So I wouldn't rule it out, but I don't think there are going to be um, a lot of players coming in because I just I, I just wouldn't see that there'd be room within the within the dressing room for everybody to get changed every morning. <laughs> yeah, no, some of these players aren't going to have pegs, are they, to hang their coats on? Um Car park all the cars at the moment. <laughs> well, they have an overflow car park. <laughs> what do you make of Forest transfer policy historically over the last few years? Is it to the owner's credit uh, under Marinakis that he's chasing the dream or is it a bit too mental? Where do you stand on that issue? Because it's the kind of the hot to- topic of the transfer window before Lamucci was sacked. Yeah, I, 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 and it's only my opinion, but I, I prefer a more, I'd probably, I'd almost describe it as a more sensible approach. You know, mm. I think the narrow down targets, I think they've gone for numbers. A lot of the time they've taken gambles. I mean, obviously they've got a big scouting network and they have people in positions who are identifying players. But I think the fact of the matter is, the, the number of players who have been brought in who simply haven't turned out to be good enough tells you that there are issues. So mm. they have missed on a lot of players. They've hit on some, but they've missed on quite a few others. It's not been that bad from a Forest perspective, though, because they've been prepared to sign so many. So they've increased the odds of accumulating enough players to put together a decent team. I think what you'll find with Chris is it'll be a much more measured approach. The targets will be narrowed down. And it, it, the transfer dealings now will become less frequent. I don't think you're going to see this massive amount of players coming in every season, huge amount of players going out, gigantic overhaul with the squad. It's not the way he's operated in the past. And I don't think he'll operate that way now. He'll want to build a unit. He'll want to build a squad. He'll want to get the numbers down so it's manageable but deep enough. So I think in terms of the transfer policy, I'd like to think that he's got the, the power now to influence that because I think you've got to be joined up as a club. I think the manager has to be joined up with the, the recruitment team and vice versa. The recruitment team needs to know the kind of players that the manager wants to work with. To do that, you need some stability at the management position, don't you? So you, know, you can't just go through one season and then change the manager because then all of a sudden you get a patchwork quilt of a squad. I think in Chris's case, if, if he can be there now for a significant amount of time, two, three seasons, maybe longer, get Forrest into the Premier League and stay there, then all of a sudden you'll start to see all of those strategies become a lot more workable because they'll be picking the kind of players that he wants to work with in his system and, and then it'll be easier to do. Yeah, I mean, for what it's worth, I think the problem uh, all too often is a lot of these signings are either as good or slightly worse than what they're replacing and the, the, they don't really advance the squad um, too often. I think... Um, Matt, like, I think they take gambles to the extent that they take gambles on. Yeah. When you're trying to catch lightning in a bottle, that's fine. I and mean, you see it occasionally. I mean, I think back to the season when QPR got promoted and Adel Tarat played for them that year. And nobody had really seen that when he was Tottenham, but he dropped into the championship and it was the reason why they got promoted. And, and I think other teams have been able to find that special player who, who's been the missing ingredient that's turned them from a, an OK team to a promotion team. And, and they, you kind of ride the back of that player and he takes you as far as he can. And I think they've tried that with players like Carvalho. But, but it just hasn't worked. They've just, they've just not been good enough in the championship or good enough might be the wrong word. They've just not been able to adapt what they do to a league like the Championship, which is unique in its own way in terms of the number of games you play, the type of football you're involved in, the kind of games that you're involved in, what's at stake. I mean, it's a really, really difficult league to get out of. Nobody needs me to tell them that. So I, I, I think they've taken too many gambles trying to find the special player, overthinking it in many ways, you know, bringing in players that, that people aren't aware of, but almost trying to prove that... that this recruitment guy knows best. I found that special one. And you've only got to look at the turnover of players in and players out to know that that strategy hasn't worked. You know, the players that have got experience of the division tend to be the ones that have, that have succeeded. I mean, the, the obvious exception would be the goalkeeper, Bree Samba, who's been excellent, tremendous find, real asset to the club. But, but there aren't many more that you'd put in that bracket and say, 
nobody had really heard of this fella, but what a player he is. It's very, very rare that that happens. And I, and I like to think they take a more measured approach now and, and start to look at players with genuine experience of the situation they find themselves in, a track record of being successful um, in the championship and then beyond, and start to, to, to enter the transfer market with a strategy more like that than the one we've seen. Um, there's a question here from Graham Irving. Uh, I'm not sure if this player will come back in from the cold, but he says, can you see someone like Zach Clough coming in from the cold? We're slightly lacking um, as a number 10. I was thinking more Michael Dawson or someone like that. Do you think there might be a player who's been frozen out who might get a shot now under a different manager? I think the beauty of it is whenever a manager comes in, a lot of, a lot of the time it's down to the individual, isn't it? <laughs> if, if all of a sudden that player thinks, I've got a clean slate now, so whatever's gone before, I can now prove myself to the new manager and I'm, I'm going to make sure I do that. I think it's, it's as much down to the player as it is the manager. Because, I mean, Chris is going to come in thinking, look, the best 11 that I can find are going to be the 11 players that I pick. He's not going to come in there with any misconceptions about anybody. So, you know, I, I think Zach is just one example. But there are lots of players within that room who may well think, well, look, I didn't really fit under Sabri. Um but I've got a chance under Chris. And you'd like to think that everybody that's not been involved at the moment is looking at it that way. And, of course, the way Chris plays will be, will be key to that as well. I mean, Sabri was very set in the formation that he played, the way that he played, and it did limit the opportunities for certain individuals. You know, Chris may well come in and play in an entirely different way to Sabri. And, and if he does, then that's going to open up opportunities for players in the squad who before now weren't being given the chance. So I think that's going to develop over the next few matches when Chris works out what his tactics are going to be. And, and at that point, players may well be given the opportunity to, to get themselves back in favour. But I think that's going to be down to them as much as it will him. Um, you're around footballers a lot, so you can you know what they're like. If you're a player who's like, say, Cafu or Bashiru, who thought, hang on a minute, I'm signing for Sabri Lamucci here, and then a new manager comes in, uh, or even an established player like Joe Lolly, who seems to be a bit in and out at the moment. I mean, what do you think this dressing room is going to make of it after such a, a big summer shake-up? Well, I, I think th what, what they better make of it is they better think, right, I need to knuckle down here and impress the new manager. I think if they go about it in any other way, then <laughs> they'll be, the, they'll be the, the individuals that miss out. You know, I think everybody's got to look at this now as a fresh start. Chris Hewton comes in knowing how he wants to play, what he wants from his squad, the kind of players that he wants to work with. And you've got to make sure you fit into that. And I think he's also experienced enough and probably confident enough in his own ability to be able to make big decisions and potentially unpopular decisions, knowing that he's been here before and he's got it right before. And he's probably pretty confident he's going to get it right again. So, you know, the, the players, the, if the players have displayed an attitude that's anything less than, than, than perfect under Sabri Lamushi, then it's on them. And mm. they have to carry an element of responsibility for him losing his job. And if they've got to up the game under Chris Hewton, my, my, my suggestion would be that they do it sooner rather than later because I think you'll find now that Forrest have got a manager that won't be carrying passengers, that, that he's going to pick the players that he thinks can... He doesn't want to manage in the championship. The reason he's taking the Forrest job is because he thinks it's a good way for him to get back into the Premier League. And believe me, the players that he believes can get into the Premier League will be the ones that make the journey. The ones that he thinks aren't right, they'll be gone because he knows what it takes. So, you know, this is, this is, this is Chris Hewton not wanting to manage Forrest in the Championship. This is Chris Hewton who sees himself as a Premier League manager and wants to get back there as quickly as possible. Uh, Craig Shepherd's uh, touching on something I was going to ask you about. Um, what does Darren think Forrest's ambition is this season? No club's ever started as badly as us. Um, I saw a stat that Hewton's full seasons in the Championship, I think he's finished third, fourth, 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 or something like that. Yeah. What do you think Forrest can do now with only four games gone? Well, I think that's the key. It's only four games gone. I mean, that, that's the important thing. If we were having the conversation 10 games in and you've narrowed it down to 36 games to try and get yourself back up there, then it, it, it gets more difficult. But he's still got 42 matches and it's a long time. And it's the kind of division where you can come with a late run. I mean, how often do you see a team at Christmas 
not involved in it. And by the time the end of the season comes, they're in the playoffs and they're the form team. This is, there are so many games in such a short, spirit, short period of time that, that you can get yourself back in it. And this division will look so different if Forrest go through the next 10 games and win six and draw one and maybe lose three and then take a look at the table. All of a sudden, they would be a mid-table side on the verge of the playoffs, moving in the right direction with momentum, with belief, with confidence and moving towards the the transfer window in January where Chris could potentially bring in two or three that might just make the difference and push them on. There's plenty of time left in the season for Forrest to turn it around. I know what the numbers tell you and I know they've made it really difficult and I know the backs are against the wall already. 42 matches is a long, long time, particularly when you've got a manager that has the kind of track record that he's got in this division. So I wouldn't be too concerned. The concern I would have is that if in a few games time, not a great deal has changed, then you've got issues. But there's still, there's still more than enough time for them to have a, a competitive season, get themselves in the mix and, and you know, try and achieve what they wanted to in the summer. I'm going to break off from the conversation for a second and give you some compliments. Uh, Barry Wright says, I loved your commentary on Century FM. We're going back a few years there. Yeah. And John Brody says, going back a few years, but Darren's commentary was great. So some compliments for you there, which is always nice. From I bet there's some other ones that you can't put up as well. That tends to be the case, but we're not too concerned about that either. Actually, no, I'll there's tell you what not. I would say I was... to those fellas, I'll tell you what I would say to those fellas. It's still my, my dream and my desire that before I retire as a commentator, I want to do another season covering Forest, so that that would be if, if I if I could if I could choose the way that my career ended, it would be where I started and covering my hometown club for another season. So that would be nice. So if anybody needs me at any stage, let me know. <laughs> well, if Colin Frey needs a year to go gap year travelling <laughs> to Colin Australia and Bali or something, for, yeah, if Colin wants to go on holiday for a game. I'm happy to stand in. Um, I was going to ask you more about Lamucci. You touched on about he was quite set in his ways. Do you think that was part of his downfall in terms yeah, of personal do. comfortability? Yeah, I do. No, I, I very stubborn was, tactically. I think it was a huge part of his downfall. I mean, I, I, I only come I only come at this from a really base level knowledge of it all. But but my my opinion of the championship is that you you win games and you lose games in the championship. Draws I don't think are a great deal of use to you. I mean, if you look at it numerically. You could win 23 and lose 23 and be right in the promotion mix at the end mm. of the season. You know, you, 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 it could be that black and white for you as a club. I could never work out why he wouldn't play two up top. And I could never work out why against weaker teams, he wasn't prepared to go and take them on, take them to the cleaners, build momentum, build confidence. I'll never get away from the night I sat there in the main stand and I watched them play Charlton two or three days after they'd gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Leeds. And I couldn't believe what I saw. That The team was totally changed. They were on the back foot. They were negative. They were playing a team at that point that was heading towards relegation. And I was baffled by it. And I just think this sends totally the wrong message to the supporters, to the players, to mm. everybody associated with it. I just do think you, that... Do you think that was the beginning of the end? Sorry to interrupt. In terms of the players must look at that and think, hang on a minute. Well, they never we recovered, need to they? Do this. They never mm. recovered from that point. You know, the season went downhill from then. And that was the real chance. They'd just played the best team in the division and been excellent against them. And the atmosphere in the stadium that day was as good as I've heard it for a long, long time. You know, you get an atmosphere like that when Derby come to town and Forrest are winning. But that day was brilliant. And what a building block, what a springboard that should have been to kick you on, finish the season well. You know, the rest of the division must have been thinking, blimey, look at these. You know, nobody else has been able to, to, to withstand Leeds in this manner. But they, they had a really good day that day. And then to do what he did in the midweek was baffling. I, I had no idea what he was thinking. And it was just that, it's just that negativity at home. You know, you, you've got to be winning your home games. And there was enough talent in the Forest squad last season to win the home games. And I could never work out why he didn't take the leash off at home. And all right, maybe, you know, if, if, if you're set in your ways and you want to play with one up top and you want to play with two holders in midfield and you want to rely on defence first, that's OK. But when that's not working, you know, I have to... Ability to go, well, let's change it now. Let's put on an extra striker. 
you know, you're going to sign Lyle Taylor in the summer. Let's play Lyle Taylor with Lewis Graben and see whether it works. Let's let's just not rotate the two of them, one on, one off. Because mm. that, that clearly wasn't working at the back end of, of last season. And I also think as well, Matt, if you're going to play that way, you have to be brilliant defensively. Yeah. Because this is such a bizarre division that you cannot really not concede goals. It's just that kind of division where you get strange results, teams score plenty of goals. It's a pretty open division. There's a lot of direct football. The ball gets from back to front really quickly. So it's really hard, I think, to, to have a side that's built on clean sheets, not conceding too many goals and nicking goals here and there. I think in the Premier League, you can, you can, you can plan and play that way. I think in the Championship, it's really hard. So I'm not necessarily sure over 46 games whether those tactics were, were really going to pay off anyway. Mm. What do you make of the squad that Chris inherits then? Because in, um, Forest have a reputation for bringing young players through. Yeah. The average age over the summer has actually ticked up quite a lot with the fair few players who are 30, 31. Is that to Chris's benefit that those players will have been there and done that? Or is it to his detriment that a bit hard, harder to mould and might be a bit set in their ways themselves? How do you see that? What I would say is I, I think it's difficult right now to make a, a solid judgment on what the squad actually is because there are so many players and he won't use all of them by any stretch and it's going to be interesting to see which ones he decides he doesn't want to use as opposed to the ones that he does and then you will see the way that it's going to go from there I, I look at it at the moment and you would say right now that to, to get the to get the team moving you you would probably be looking at the more experienced players the tried and tested players to get a bit of confidence back into into the room because they, they they can't be playing with any confidence whatsoever. You know, first of all, they need a lift. Mm. It's not just the four matches this season, it's the way last season finished as well. So they've got to get the confidence back into the room to start with and give them the belief that they can win games again. Then, you know, I, there are experienced players, there are young players, there are... British players, there are foreign players, there are flair players, there are hard-working players. There's all kinds of players in there. I mean, there is there is pretty much everything in there. It, it's not like he's, he's missing anybody to choose from. So I'm going to be fascinated. I, I don't really know how he'll do it or what he'll do. I think about the Brighton team, the last team that he managed, and I think about when he was when he was at Newcastle, and I don't think he's going to change a great deal from, from, from what he did there. He's never struck me as a gambler, as a manager. You know, I, I think he, I think he likes to work with players that he knows, and I think he likes to work with players that can work within his system. I don't think he wants to take too many chances, so that might give you an indicator as to as to what he might do. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think if 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 he got ten players less than he's got now to choose from and work with, you could make more of an educated guess as to what it what it will look like. But going back to the point that was made slightly earlier if a player like Zach Clough or someone else who's been frozen out, who seems like they have no future, suddenly finds themselves back in favour, then it can start to change the balance of the squad. So it's going to be really interesting to see who who he likes and who he doesn't and what he picks and how he plays. Um, it's going to be great. It's going to be fascinating to watch it. Yeah, I mean, do you think he has, they had this, you know, the notorious bomb squad with a Doma and Carvalho added to it. Does he have to go out and form another one of them or not? Because you can't keep 35 players happy. All, all, all I'd say, though, it's not necessarily a bomb squad, is it? It's a numbers game. I mean, you can't put a training session on with 35 players. No, exactly. So, you know, people like to call it a bomb squad, but it's a numbers thing. You know, and, and you can't, you turn up on a Monday with, with a load of sessions planned for the week. And you can't do that with 35 players. So at some stage, you've got to say to 10 or 12, you have to go and train over there because we, you're not going to play this week and we've got to get down to some serious work. So the sooner those numbers can be reduced, the better. So I suppose it is a bomb squad, but it's also a numbers a numbers game. And I, I, it also always concerns me as well that when you're a football club, if you walk in on a Monday morning and you've got 10, 12, 15 players who know they're not going to be involved at the weekend, that can have a real detrimental effect on the room because they're down in the dumps. They're annoyed. They want to be part of it. They want to leave. You know, they're saying all negative things about the surroundings, and that that creates a problem. So you, you've got to try and get that element away 
from the players that you're working with. So you want to have positivity and you want them excited by what they're doing. You want them looking ahead to the weekend with, 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 a, with, a, with a positive mindset. So that's a real issue. Um, and, and, you know, the question that was asked, do you think he'll bring any in? I think his biggest job is to get people out so that he can work with a number of people that suits what he wants to do. Um, and I think that'll be one of his biggest jobs. But it's difficult to move players now. I mean, look at the transfer window in the Premier League. It's just closed. And I know for a fact that Manchester United and, uh, and Chelsea wanted to move players. But the wages are so high and players won't go unless they, they get what they're getting now or their situation improves. It often baffles me how a player thinks that they can get a better situation than they're in now by not playing. But sometimes that happens. So it's hard to move players. You've seen Forrest pay one or two people off to get the numbers down. It's difficult to move them. So that's going to be a really hard job to get the numbers down from 35 or whatever it is down to 23, 24. It's difficult. So that's that's going to be a really difficult job for him to do that. In terms of, I suppose the elephant in the room is always time with football managers and especially yep. at Nottingham Forest. Um, the turnover has always been so high. Do you think that he's going to be given the time he needs because, you know, it's just not happened, has it, for most managers? I think Sabri, to be fair, was given the, was given a good shot at it. But do you think the patience is going to be there for Chris? Because it might be needed, mightn't it? I think it has to be. I, I just don't see there's any point now with the situation he inherits, bottom of the league, no wins, 30 players, and a team that's confidence is in the uh, is on the floor i don't think there's any point in giving chris the job unless you're going to commit to him long term and i'm a, i'm a big believer that you build a club from the bottom up not the top down and the foundations are there they've got a great academy they've got some really committed people working behind the scenes they've got a, a board of directors and a chairman there who have given the city belief to a large extent and have done a really good job in difficult circumstances when you have an owner overseas who maybe sees things differently to you and he's the power, it's difficult. So there are a lot of elements to this. But I think with Chris, you have to say to him now, build as the club. Build as a club that can get to the Premier League and stay in the Premier League. Because that, at the end of the day, is all they're trying to do. That's Forrest's only aim. Sole aim is to get to the Premier League and stay there. And I think the key point to that is stay there. Because a lot of the time you can get promoted to the Premier League and you can have a season. And then financially that can have a really detrimental effect on you because all of a sudden you're saddled with a big wage bill, contracts you don't want, players earning wages that, that they wouldn't be on in the Championship, but you're committed to them because you needed them for the Premier League. I think that, that, that second season, the stay in their season... Is, is a really undervalued part of what these managers do. Chris has got the track record of getting up and staying up. And I, I think that's the key. People say, well, we've just got to get out. No, you haven't. You've got to get out and then you've got to stay there for a season at least and build. And I think that's the important thing for Forrest. It's not just getting out. It's getting out and then having a man that you feel can, can navigate his way around the Premier League season to keep you up. And at that stage, then you can start to really build it. And he's done that on more than one occasion. So you've then got to give him the opportunity to do that. Because sometimes you get lucky, don't you? They, they've, you know, they've gone through a whole list of managers down there. But I think this looks to be as good a fit as probably anybody they've had. Mm. You know, I can't remember too many people walking in there with the CV that he's got and, and it's it's the perfect fit, isn't it? You know, if, if Forrest were a, a mid-table Premier League team, he probably wouldn't be as good a fit as he is now. But they're not. They're a championship team that wants to get up and stay up, and he's really good at that. So he looks the perfect fit. The club wants to get where he wants to get to, and he wants to get where the club wants to get to. So let's hope they can do it together, because I think this is, this is kind of all the... I, I use Man United as the, as the example, Matt. I think timing's huge in appointing managers. And if you think about it, so Alex Ferguson retires and they appoint David Moyes. They just miss out on Pep Guardiola. So Pep goes to Manchester City. Timing wasn't right. They then go through another process of, of, of hiring a manager and they just miss out on Jurgen Klopp. The timing's wrong. 
Mm. So they, 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 you look at them now and you think, well, Pochettino's there. If he's going to be your manager, you might just have to bite the bullet, get rid of Solskjaer and put him in. Otherwise, he's going to get a job. And then when it comes to getting rid of Solskjaer, who's going to, you're going to miss out again. You've then missed out on Pochettino. On this occasion, all the cards have fallen. All the dominoes have gone down at the right time. Forrest needed manager. Chris Hewton's available. He's exactly what they need. He's also exactly what they want. So you get a really, really proven Premier League manager at your football club because everything in terms of timing was right. So I think they've got to feel grateful for that. They've made the right decision. They were brave. They went out there and made the managerial change because they identified a player, a manager rather, who was available, who they could get. So let's just hope now that the, the sense prevails. He gets a, a decent run at it. And let's say he doesn't get promoted this year. Well, that might be down to the fact that he inherited a squad that was too big. It took too long to rebuild the confidence because of the way last season ended and this season started. So maybe you've got to swallow that and you've got to say, right, that's no problem. It wasn't about this season. It's about next season. Now we're all systems go. Now we've got the squad that he wants. The numbers are right. Everybody knows him. The players are confident. We're ready to really hit the ground running and they can get momentum at the start of the season, carry it through and then keep it rolling. So I don't think it has to be about this year. I don't think fans should look at him and say, oh, well, if he doesn't get us up this year, we'll be looking to change again. I don't think the fans on the board should see it that way. I think you should probably assess Chris at Christmas ne next year, midway through next season, because none of these players are his own either. So, and he's got a real, I, said, I used the phrase at the start, he's got a real patchwork quilt of a squad. A lot of different people have signed a lot of those players. So there's not really a plan. There's just a lot of individuals clumped together and they're trying to put 11 on the pitch from that that they think's right. So it's, that, that, that's not an easy thing to do. You know, normally you're signing a certain type and you've got a certain demographic that you're looking at and it, you, you, you know you need a left back, so you want a certain type, so you narrow it down. That's never really been the case there. This is just a lot of players from all over the place thrown together. And that's going to take a bit of sorting out and working through. And he's got to do that now in season while he's trying to win games as well. So it might not be about this, this season. It might take a, a little bit more time than that. So I think people just have to be aware of it. And, and I think if, if you start to hear rumblings at any stage that they're not happy with Chris, I mean, Lord help everybody. They've just got to sit back now and let him do what he does. Build the club, do it his way, do it the right way, do it organically, don't rush it and get it right. Because ultimately, it's all about getting it right, isn't it? Mm, true. A uh, comment here from uh, Owen Bailey just saying about picking up on what you were saying about proven players, proven managers, now it might be the time. There's a couple more things I wanted to ask you, Darren, before we let, we let you go. Um, you're lucky enough to travel not just around the country, but around Europe with BT Sport commentating on games. How do you think Forrest are viewed now within the game? Are they still a massive club, you know, living off the European years? Or has their um, cachet dropped a little bit, do you think, in the last few years? Everybody knows them, obviously. Everybody knows them. You know, from, from the European days, everybody knows them. When I speak to people, where are you from? I'm from Nottingham, Nottingham Forest. Oh, yeah, but everybody knows. Especially when we're covering the Champions League, because obviously they've, they've, they've won the trophy twice. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the, the cachet is still there, but it's, it's, it's nowhere near what it was. And people do kind of say... Oh, what happened to them? Because, you know, they're, they're not, people aren't automatically, people watch the Premier League, they're not automatically watching the championships and they, they perhaps don't quite know where they are anymore because they don't see them in the Premier League. So people want to know where they are. So, you know, it, it, it's not what it was. What I would say, though, I'll tell you what was interesting, and I'd say this to Forest fans. I, um, I went to Olympiacos last year. Spurs played there in the Champions League and I went. And obviously we know that Mr. Maranakis is the owner of, of Olympiacos and he's the owner of Forest and that Yanis, who's the chief executive was, was at Olympiacos too and there's a real connection between the two clubs for obvious reasons having the same owner what a fantastic setup they've got there and if, and if anybody wonders about what Forest could look like moving forward, they would be a really good example, they have a brand new ground a lot of corporate hospitality everything is bright and shiny there's a wonderful fan base there, everything seemed to be done the right way, so I looked at that and that gave me greater belief that they can get back to where they want to be. Just looking at the way that club's running in Greece, it was, was, was eye-opening in a positive sense. 
So you would like to think that ultimately that's what Forest could look like. So that 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 as a as a Nottingham lad and a, and a Forest fan, um, that gave me a little bit more hope and belief that it can all look really good in the end. So whether that makes anybody feel better, I don't know. But that was certainly the feeling I got by being there last year. The last thing I was going to ask you about being a Forest fan, um, are you able to watch games as a fan when commentators are on? Or are you sat there thinking, oh, I'd never have said that. That guy's completely messed up there. I'll tell you what I do. I actually watch it to, to try and learn from them. Ah, OK. Uh, if they do things better than me, then I, I might nick it every now and again. And I, um, yeah, I, I, I watch it. I watch it because I enjoy it, but I want to try and learn and get better because there's, there's so many good commentators, they can help me get better. So um, I, I kind of watch it like that. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got, I've got I have my little boy next to me most of the time asking me a million questions, so I don't get too, don't get too, too many opportunities to listen too much because he wants to ask questions about the game all the time. But, but no, I love it. Um, I try and watch Forrest whenever I can. I, I, I go to the games with him whenever I can. He's in the academy there, so we're, we're, we're down at the training ground an awful lot. So Forests are, are a huge part of, of our lives and a huge part of my life. They're my club. Um, and I, 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 still, I still cherish those early years I had as a teenager when I first started working on the radio in Nottingham to be able to work with the last great Forest team Cluffy towards the end when they were getting to cup finals with Dares and Stewart and, and, and Nigel, etc. That still is one of, if not the most special time that I worked as a, as a broadcaster was to be around to, to be around Cluffy and be around those people. So that, that's that's still something that I hold in in, in, in great regard. I'm not just reading out the good comments about you here, but there's one here from John Michael White. Um, great sense from Darren. I'll never forget him commentating on uh, John Olaf Yelder scoring at Preston with nine men. Uh, all the draw against Comptry with nine men. Great to see him doing so well. Uh, and I described Big John as a, 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 a farmer's boy from the north of Norway, which is really <laughs> that day. And he, 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 was, he was country strong, was our John. Told me once, I think John told me once that he lived in a little village in Norway and when he, he used to go home for the summer and when he come, when he came back, it was such a tight community, he never even bothered locking the door of his house. He just left the, the house open and people would just look after it for him while he was in England playing for Forest. <laughs> uh, another one, just David Bond saying, uh, Top Bloke really enjoyed listening to him. So, uh, yeah, plenty of love for you for Forest fans, which is probably nice. Um we are in the business of pointless predictions on this podcast. Um, there's no there's no game against Blackburn, but I'll put you on the spot and um, give us your entirely pointless prediction of how this Chris Hewson uh, regime is going to play out. What, what's, what, do you, what are you saying? I think that by the end of this season, they will be nearer to the playoffs than anywhere else. And it wouldn't surprise me if he gets them into the playoffs. Whether this season is a season too soon to get up, I don't know. But I think all the negativity and all the fear at the minute that Forest supporters have, with, which, is, which is understandable because of the, the way the season started and the way last season finished. And believe me, I feel I feel the same as you because I thought last year was the year and I was, I was getting a bit giddy about that. And I've had to eat a bit of humble pie around the fellas at work because I was saying, no, nah, this is it, this is it. But I, I, I do genuinely feel that they've got the right man now. Uh, the right man with the right approach, with the right credentials, with the right attitude, the, the kind of person that the fans will respect and like. And I think he will represent the club fantastically. And I think over the, over the fullness of time, he will get this right and he will get this club into the Premier League. It might just take a little bit longer than people think. That it's just, there's a lot of things against him at the moment. And that is size of squad, getting to know everybody, the run of defeats. It might not happen overnight. It might take a little bit of time before you start to see it. But just let it work and let it be what it's going to be for now, knowing that it will get better down the line. And as I say, it might not be this year, but I would think they'd be pretty damn close next year if, if it doesn't happen this year. Um, I'm 100% convinced 
that he's the right person for the job. And I, I can't say that I felt that way. Poor oh, blimey. I don't know. I don't know when. I mean, there's so many managers, it's difficult to pick one out and go, well, it was, it was, it was him. Hmm. I, I, I tell you what, I tell you, I tell you the point I'd make. I would go back to the, the summer of 1993 and Forrest had just been relegated. Brian Clough had just retired and they went out and they gave Frank Clark the job. Frank, who's a dear friend of mine. I see him every day, lives around the corner and is, is still a huge part of the scene at the city ground. But they gave Frank Clark the job and Frank was the perfect appointment. He was solid. He was sensible. He looked at everything logically. He knew what he had to do. He knew the club, which is a big advantage he's got over Chris. He knew the city, which is a big advantage he got over Chris. But you looked at Frank and you thought, Frank will never let anybody down. Frank's going to do the right thing at the right time in difficult circumstances. And his circumstances, by the way, are a lot more difficult than these because he he was following a a legend, the, the greatest manager for me in the history of football. And he, he just got relegated. But I look at Chris now, and I think there are parallels to, to this appointment because it is negative and there are a lot of issues and things do need working out. And one or two mindsets down there do need to change. But I think he'll do all the right things. So that gives me confidence that I don't think he's going to do anything where you think, why did he do that? You know, why is he playing like that? Why has he signed him? I don't think you're going to get that with Chris. I think you're going to understand what he's doing. And I think as fans, we'll all be able to see what the process is. And by doing that, we can buy into it. So I, I, that, that, would be the, that would be the parallel I would make with this appointment compared to previous ones. There is no gamble being taken here. It's not somebody that we don't know. We're not going to fall in love with him one minute because we, we didn't know anything about him and he's won a few matches. So now he's the best thing since sliced bread. We're not going to do that because we know Chris. So... And we're also not going to say, well, he's got no idea what he's doing because we've never heard of him and he has no track record in England and he's not won a few matches. So we're going to, we're going to, we're, we'll level off as, as fans too. So I think it'll work. I think it'll work really well. Um, I'm going to get right behind him um, and keep my fingers crossed. And, and I, I think this could be the start of something really good. I really do. Genuinely do. I'm not just saying this for, for your benefit, Matt. I genuinely think this is a really, really good appointment. I said to somebody the other week, if they get rid of, Stabri Lamushi, they've got to go for one or two people. They've either got to go for Big Sam or they've got to go for Chris Hewton. And some might say, well, I'm not sure about the football, X, Y, and Z. Forget the football, got to get to the Premier League. It doesn't matter how you get there. You've just got to get there. And then you've got to stay there and then you can work it out as a Premier League club. So I think in, 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 in that regard, they've gone and got the right fella at the right time. And I think it's going to work brilliantly. Excellent. We hope you're right, all of us who are watching along. By the way, if I'm wrong, you can get me back on and slaughter me. Everybody can. <laughs> I do genuinely believe that he's a great appointment. Yeah, the comments won't be as nice next time on if, you, if you're wrong. Yeah, that idiot. Off. He, well, he doesn't <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. And thanks for everyone who's watched along and put the questions and comments to Darren. Uh, we do appreciate you joining us as ever. Um, Yeah, thanks for giving us so much of your time, Darren. We're grateful. I know you're a busy man. I thought I'd take a shot at inviting you to join international break. So we do appreciate you uh, being so generous with your time. It's my pleasure, mate. Any time time, uh, is is, is fine by me. Excellent. Um, Thanks to everyone who listened. Do listen uh, and give us a like on iTunes, YouTube. uh, Subscribe. Give us a great rating and comment. It all helps and it boosts my ego. So we'll be back um, next week as ever. uh, Unless there's any other major breaking news, in case we'll we'll be back sooner then. But hopefully uh, we can all rest easy now. And we hope everyone has a good weekend. We will see you soon. Thank you for listening to Garibaldi Red, a Nottingham Forest podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Thanks for listening.